gave here this morning uh, to the congregation. Those of you who are logging in online uh, to our Facebook page, welcome. We're glad that you're here and glad that you chose to spend time with us here this morning. Uh, I have a bit of news for you, and some big news and some good news. Uh, of course, we have heard a lot has changed this past week, including uh, in Cat County, if I've been going back down to Orange, and the new CDC guidelines coming out, which says if you have been vaccinated, you don't need to wear these things inside. Now, I know people are just don't feel comfortable yet going out, feel more comfortable having it on. You're invited to leave them on. If you haven't got vaccinated yet, you can leave them on. But if you've been vaccinated, according to CDC, we can take these off. So <laughs> you're invited to do so and praise the Lord. And uh, yeah, like I said, if you feel more comfortable leaving them on, please do. The last thing we want is to have anybody uncomfortable in God's house. Uh, so uh, stay, stay right there. Uh, so, well, praise God for that. It's a praise Jesus moment for sure. Uh, just to let you know, the new uh, daily breads are back on the table for June, July, and August. So if you would like one and you haven't picked one up yet, please do on your way out. You also saw coming in today, uh, asking not only for your red, regular offerings, but for the noisy change. This is the third Sunday of the month, so we do a noisy change uh, collection. And that benefits our youth program. So uh, if you have the youth, then uh, help us out. Uh, if you wish to have a picture, it's, we've been saying in the bulletin in the newsletter, we're planning a special Memorial Day tribute here in two weeks. Uh, and if you have a loved one who was in the service who since passed away, and you would like to get their uh, picture in the honor roll that we're going to do a presentation that day, uh, please get it in as soon as possible. We've had a wonderful response so far. Uh, uh, we've been, I think we're up to 20 now uh, between the two churches, so that's fantastic, and I hope you'll enjoy that. So uh, if you have not done that already, please do. Also, I call your attention to the insert in the bulletin, uh, which is one of the reasons why I'm dressed in this great uh, preaching attire this morning. <laughs> oh. I, I thought I saw you pointing the arrow, and I couldn't figure out what you were talking about. Here the uh, microphone came off, and it was on the ground. I don't know that you heard much from my feet, but um, hopefully we'll... Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Well, for those at home who missed anything, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll, uh, uh, we'll make sure that that's on. But anyway, uh, next Saturday, uh, May 22nd is the World Vision uh, Global 6K Walk for Water. And that's what this information is about. We've been talking about it. At eight, the local walk is at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning, the 22nd, at Emory Adams Park in Finley. For those who know the park, it's uh, we're going to begin and end at the footbridge at the south end of the park. Uh, and so if you can walk, you can register. The information is here uh, to register. Uh, if you cannot walk that day but wish to walk on your own, you can do so at any time, at any place you wish. Uh, you can register for that. And also, uh, you can, uh, if you're not able to walk but want to participate, uh, you can donate money on there as well. And the purpose of that is to raise money to drill wells in Africa at these communities uh, that don't have uh, close drinking water. 6K, it seems like an odd amount. Usually you see 5K, 10K, 6K. It's about 3.7 miles, which is the average. Most of these kids have to walk to and from uh, the location to get water. And usually it's not safe drinking water or anything. It's, uh, so we are trying to help that out. So uh, if you're able, we ask you to participate, and we'll report on that. And then on the back, Christian Clearinghouse is having their auction next week at 10 o'clock. So you can go walk at 8 and then go out to the Family Center in North Blanchard Street in Finley for the Christian Clearinghouse auction. They had their big fundraiser every year, big garage sale, and a week before, or days before, actually, it happened last year, the pandemic hit, and they had to shut down, and everything all collected. So they stored three semi-trailer fulls of the best of what they had, and since they can't do the sale again this year, they're having an auction outside in the parking lot of the building. So that's at 10 o'clock. Uh, Christian Clearing House is at 
uh, organization based uh, for people who live and work in Finley, uh, helping with uh, people facing financial, emotional, and spiritual needs in Hancock County. We'll tell you more about that. Your ad council has elected, as has present you, has elected to uh, partic become a participating congregation in that. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, but uh, I invite you to that, that as well. Do we have any other announcements? I, I've, got, I've got two other things I want to point out here in a moment, but do we have any other announcements of activities uh, for uh, the good of the order this morning? Well, I know that on uh, Tuesday, Olivia Harris, an order's granddaughter, has a birthday coming up, and Madison Montgomery has a birthday coming up, but today, Carolyn Green is having a birthday today, according to our list. So a happy birthday, Carolyn. So glad that you were here. And uh, let's, let's sing a happy birthday to Carolyn. I know that's out of the ordinary, but she's a, that way she's a special ordinary person. So <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Carolyn. Happy birthday. Welcome, and aren't you glad you came now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, happy birthday. Uh, I will you prepare our hearts and minds for worship. <laughs> Thank you, Lana. People of God, worship the living God today. 
Remember that out of nothing God created the heavens and the earth. Remember that God raised Jesus from the powerlessness of death to the power of his right hand. Remember that in a world full of groaning and longing for our final redemption, our God, the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, our God works all things out for the good of those who love him. Remember that nothing, not disease or viruses, not tornadoes or floods, people or governments, not even the gates of hell, can stand against God's loving purpose or plan to redeem and restore all things for his glory. Behold, your God, who reigns now and forever, let us pray. Blessed are you, Holy One, creator of all that is and all that will ever be. You sent your holy child, Jesus, to heal us and bless us, to show us your love. After his suffering and death on the cross, he was still among us, proclaiming repentance and forgiveness of sins for all who call on his name. Just as you sent the power of the Holy Spirit to those who first believed, fill us now with your power and grace that we may become the hands and feet and the heart and the spirit of Christ. Amen. Will you please join me in our opening hymn, uh, which can be found on page 514. We're going to sing the first, third, and fourth verses, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. And uh, you can't sing that song if you can't stand up. So if you're able, uh, please stand up and join us in our opening hymn. And if you can turn in your red praise book to page 108, his name is wonderful as our praise hymn this morning.
Thank you. You may be seated. We've come to the time in our worship service together to lift up our joys and concerns, and there's a number of them. What did I do with my my bulletin here? Oh, there it is. I have stuff written on it, that's why. Um, I do obviously want to give thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for the signs of improvement for the vaccine that has come out for the dropping rates of infection for the uh, plummeting rates of death to this horrible disease. We certainly have come a long way in the last year and he's been with us throughout and we just give him thanks and praise for that. I do want to lift up uh, somebody that's on our list, uh, Georgia Salisbury, who some of you know from New Hope uh, Church over in Rawson. Uh, she's been battling um, lung cancer, and she ended up going into the hospital um, this past Wednesday and uh, remains there um, with uh, some internal bleeding and stuff, so we, we need to keep her in prayer. I was asked to go over. I know her personally, so I was going anyway, but Pastor Ben Lowell of that church asked me to fill in for him because he's not able, he was not able to get up to see her. And uh, just a report on him, he is on the cusp of retiring here, but they, he and his wife are now at their home in Van Buren. He is recuperating from his surgery, his major surgery. He's able to get around the house all right, but he doesn't feel comfortable being out without a walker. Um, but it was a successful surgery. His pain is greatly reduced, and um, he'll be wearing a back brace for about six months. But uh, praise God, he's got healing for him. Of course, uh, you note in the, uh, in the bulletin, on the back of the bulletin, uh, we're uh, extending sympathy to uh, Nordy Ryder and her family on loss of her sister, Mary Kenyon, and also uh, Patty Welch. Um, and her family on the loss of Aunt uh, Teresa Serrera uh, this past week, and we lift them up. I know that uh, we also need to keep in prayer uh, Kenzie Welsh. I know we've been praying for her a lot, but Tuesday is her next surgery, uh, and uh, we uh, pray that uh, that is the last one and that it is successful and it goes very well. Um, and of course, we continue to pray for John Kuntz and Scott Blakely and Alicia uh, Welch and all of those on the back of our bulletin uh, who needs uh, continue uh, to be lifted up to the Lord. Do we have others? Uh, if you have a prayer request, Nancy will bring a microphone around to you. She'll hold it for you so we don't have it passed hand to hand. But do we have any other praises or prayer requests we need to lift up this morning? Oh, yes. Um, if you would just remember Emily on Friday, she will be having surgery at Riverside Hospital in Columbus um, to have her thyroid removed. She is number 10 on my dad's side of the family, so there are indeed thyroid issues. And also, if you could just say a little prayer for me, because I just have a really bad feeling that they're going to discharge her right smack dab in the middle of Columbus rush hour traffic on Friday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we definitely will remember. I don't know which of the two of you need more prayer in that regard. <laughs> but uh, we do pray that everything goes well for Emily uh, this Friday. Any other joys and concerns? Regina. Just an update on Tom. He got a good report this week at the doctor. He still cannot do too much for the next two weeks, but he's doing well. Very well. That's Tom Houston, who's had recent hernia surgery, and we're uh, praising God for the healing that uh, is, he is working in Tom's life and continues to. Are there others? Yes. Uh, Them, uh, uh, they are doing well right now. Thank you. 
very well. Uh, that's prayers for Mike Hoffman. Uh, any others? With that, uh, let's uh, join together in our prayer hymn. You can find that on page 362, Nothing But the Blood. Uh, we will just sing the first and fourth verses. Sweet, loving Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in praise for all the blessings you bestow on us each and every day. We thank you for this house of worship. We thank you for the sunshine and the warmth. We thank you for the rain that helped things grow. We know the blessings that you give us are immeasurable. And we thank you for your love, for your care for us. It's hard for us to understand sometimes that the creator of the universe would care for us, mere mortal individuals, but you do. And you listen to us. You're a God who listens to our prayers. We have so many prayers we need to lift up. Lord, we've been praying for the people in our bulletin for some time, and you know each one of those particularly lifting up Kenzie and Alinda and Alicia and Jim and Georgia and Pastor Ben and John. You know each situation. You know what's needed. We just ask you to be with Kenzie and with Emily as they face surgery this week and we know that you'll be with them but Calm their hearts, relieve their fears, give the doctors and medical personnel the skill that's necessary to make them completely whole again. We thank you for the answer to prayers of continued healing for Tom. And we particularly ask you to be with Georgia and Mike as they continue their treatments for cancer. Be with Scott as he continues to find out what is going on in his situation and be with Patty Welch and her family and Nordy Ryder and her family as they have had to say goodbye in this earthly journey to loved ones.
But Lord, we do thank you this morning. We thank you for the vaccine that has been developed. We thank you for uh, your presence with us throughout this past year. All the ups and downs, the, the fears and the anxieties and the loneliness and the isolation. And yet through it all, you've been right with us. And bringing us into the sunshine now today. We know we're not quite there yet, but we know that you are in control. And we thank you for the improvement that we see. Dear Lord, we know that there may be some other requests on the minds and hearts of those who are in this congregation today or those who are watching online. So we take a moment to lift up those unspoken requests now. And Father, as we came in, we dropped our tithes and offerings and our noisy change in the uh, baskets and we know that's just a small token of what you've given us, but we trust you to bless it, to use it, to multiply it, reach people's minds, hearts, and souls for your kingdom through these gifts. And finally, Father, we give you thanks and praise for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on this Ascension Sunday when we remember after his resurrection and being with us for those 40 days, your son ascended into heaven until the day of his second coming and is alive and with you at your right hand. And we thank you for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. And we thank you for the redemption that he offers. And it is in the name of that Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning to everyone. It's good to see all of you on a bright, sunny day. So I brought a few books with me today from my house. This big one says, How to Do Just About Anything. Probably some good information in there. This one is a book about America that we maybe could learn some things from. And this is a New Testament that was my dad's that I like to use. It also has this, the uh, book of Psalms and Proverbs in there. So I'm sure at school, those of you who go to school have lots of books in your classroom, right? And those of you maybe who can't read yet, I bet you love to have books read to you. So do you suppose if we take all the books and we read them and we understand everything in them, that we would have a lot of knowledge? We probably would. Although, having knowledge doesn't always mean that we're wise. Do you know the difference between knowledge and wisdom? It's kind of hard to tell the difference between those two. If we have knowledge, that means we have a lot of stuff up here. What's up here? Your brain. I used to tell my kids at school when I taught to use their IBMs, their intelligent brain material. But that doesn't always mean that we have 
that wisdom. To have wisdom, we need to take this knowledge up here and we need to use it in our everyday lives. That means you're wise. So there's a lot of people who know a lot about Jesus and study things about him and use all of his teaching in their everyday lives. Jesus said those people are wise. And he told a story about a wise man that I bet you've heard before. A wise man built his house on a rock. And a terrible storm came. The winds blew and it rained hard and it flooded. And guess what? That house stayed right there. Nothing happened to it. Because he made a good choice. He built it on a rock. Now, there are some people who also know a lot about Jesus, but they don't use his teachings in their everyday life. And Jesus called those people foolish. Do you know the story about the foolish man? Where did he build his house? On the sand. And what happened when that storm came? It went crash. Because that person didn't make such good decisions when he built his house. So Jesus wants you to be wise. So you remember to learn as much as you can about him and to use everything you've learned to help you make decisions in your daily lives. Okay? All right, let's say a prayer. Jesus, we want you to know, we want to know what you taught, but more importantly, we want to have the wisdom to take what you taught and put it into practice. Thank you for these boys and girls, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You have a great day. Our scripture this morning comes from Genesis, second chapter, verses 7 through 8, third chapter, verses 6 through 10, 7 through 19 and 23, and 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 21 to 22. Genesis, chapter 2, 7 through 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden eastward of in Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed. Uh, verses, uh, let's see, chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Uh, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they, were sewed, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam said, and, his, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Verses 17 through 19. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the fruit of the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat in your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for the dust you are, and to the dust you shall return. In verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to, uh, to, till, to till the ground from which he was taken. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22. For since man... 
since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Thank you, Sue and Nancy and Lana, for your participation in the service this morning. May God bless the reading of his holy word today. I told somebody I came in in this special pastor attire this morning that I was going to wake you visually, if not verbally. So uh, I, I hope I've done that already so we have a chance to go forward. And I, I forgot to mention, I don't know if you saw the back of the shirt, one of the, the mantras that they have at World Vision is that for every step we take is one less step they have to take. Uh, so it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, opportunity to participate in something beyond uh, our community. Uh, will you join with me in prayer? Dear Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. A number of you might be interested in something called genealogy. And for some of you younger ones who don't know what that's talking about, it's a study of your family history, uh, who your parents were and who your grandparents were, great-grandparents and so on. The interest in family trees and genealogy has exploded in recent years with the access of the internet and Ancestry.com and other things. It makes it so much easier. You can do a lot of searching without having to go uh, all over the country searching for things. I I'm particularly interested in that. Uh, some of you may have seen right after Easter I posted on social media uh, some pictures. I had an opportunity to go visit the grave of my five times great-grandfather who was a Revol Revolutionary War veteran uh, and he's buried over in Crawford County. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. Now, I know some others of you have no interest in genealogy at all and un don't understand why anybody would have an interest in it. I, I, I know who my parents are. That's good enough. And uh, beyond that, I don't care. Well, it's interesting. If you look at the Bible, a number of authors of books in the Bible thought it was important to include information about history of who came from who and, and so on. In fact, in the New Testament, two of the four gospel writers felt a need to include a family tree. In the very first chapter of the very first gospel of Matthew, we see that he wrote a genealogy of Jesus. And it started with Abraham and it went down through King David and went all the way to Jesus. And it was important for the writer of that book to let us know Jesus' connection to the father of the Jewish people, Abraham. And we'll talk more about Abraham next week. In Luke chapter 3, there's also a genealogy of Jesus. Now, Luke was written by a Gentile, one of the few, if not the only, Gentile writers in the New Testament. And he felt it was important to trace Jesus' roots and wanted to emphasize that Jesus' good news was for all people and not just for the Jews. And so he, carried, he started with Jesus and went the other way. He went back. And it went not only from Jesus all the way back through Abraham, but then it continued on all the way to a guy by the name of Adam. Well, as we will discuss later this morning, there's more that connects Jesus and Adam than just a family tree. But today we're starting on a new series called In God Made Man. We just concluded the uh, series looking at uh, various women in the Bible. We're having to turn to some of the, the male figures in the Bible. And it makes sense to start this series with a discussion of mankind's great ancestor, the head of the human family, the first to ever breathe or trod the face of the earth, and that being Adam. Of course, the word Adam means from the ground. And it's interesting because the vast majority of people, regardless of whether they're Christian or not, or even whether they believe the truth of, of the uh, story or not, almost everyone knows about the Garden of Eden, about Adam and Eve, and about the serpent, know the basics of the story. 
often take things different ways uh, and appropriate it in evil ways. I remember back when I was going to college, and it was in a, it was a fairly large town north of here, and I was going from the place where I lived in my school, and I had to drive down through and into downtown uh, where I worked uh, part-time and passed a place called Adam and Eve's New Dancing. Now, just for the record, I never went in. And I doubt very seriously if it was a religious establishment. But I point that out in that we have biblical stories that are misappropriated and used for purposes that have nothing to do with the truth of why they're there in the first place. Even Christians today will ask, well, I, I know the story, you know, it's a cute story about the apple and Adam and Eve and so on and so forth, uh, and I'm not even sure if it's true. Well, that's a story for another day. We'll get, we get to that in a few months. But assuming that this story is there for a God-divined reason, how is this very familiar man in the very first chapter or very first book of the Bible, Genesis, have anything to do with us today or the last book of the Bible, that being Revelations. And the truth of the matter is, if we get down to it, the overarching story of the Bible has everything to do with Adam. See, God created all that we know, this beautiful world, all the plants and trees, the animals and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea. And he created this paradise, this great house we call the world. And then he needed to bring a tenant to occupy that world. And he created his masterpiece, his crowning work of creation, and formed the first human, the Son of God. This man came and occupied a house, and we can't hardly even understand exactly what he found himself in. Adam found himself in a beautiful world with everything to make him happy, a world without sin, without sorrow, a house furnished with everything needed to make life content. For those of us who live in our day-to-day, -day, we can't imagine a world like that. And add on top of that the fact that God and Adam walked with each other and talked with each other in communion with each other in this beautiful place called Eden. You see, because Adam was created for relationship with God. And he wants a relation, God wants a relationship with Adam and he wants a relationship with each one of us as well. And the whole history of the human race, it's about God wooing us to him because he gave us free choice, about God wooing us to his side to be in relationship with him. And Adam was alone and needed a relationship as well, and so Eve was created. And of course, we don't know how long this period of bliss lasted, but we know that paradise was lost. We know that despite all the beauty, there was a question of what if there's more? And the one tree that they said, that God said not to eat fruit out of, they did. Now, in the scripture that Sue read today, I want to point out, for, of course, we talked about Eve the first Sunday after Easter. Uh, and her story, of course, just, just to reiterate, uh, you know, the serpent came and tempted Eve, and she ate the apple, and then she, uh, or fruit, a lot of times they use an apple, but, and then convinced uh, Adam to do so. Well, it wasn't all that much convincing that she had to do, because uh, it said that she gave some to her husband who was with her. She didn't take the fruit and then go off and run to Adam and say, hey, here, have some of this. No, he was right there. He heard the serpent. The serpent tempted Adam just as much as Eve did, if not more. So he was culpable. Of course, we know then after that, the satanic tempter led them to the forbidden fruit. 
and it became the source of sin and death. In Adam, paradise was lost. You see, he had everything. Yet still there were the nagging questions. Is God keeping something from us? And so what was their reaction once they did? That says the eyes were opened and they realized they were naked and they uh, covered themselves with fig leaves and they hid. So when God came through the garden, he had questions for them. Where are you? What he is asking is, why are you hiding from me? Not that he didn't already know. Second question, who told you that you were naked? In other words, why did you believe someone else, not me? And what is this that you have done? In other words, are you ready to take responsibility? Think of our own lives when we do something that we know is displeasing to God or against his word, or we know would disappoint him. And sometimes we like to hide or think we can. Of course, we know we can't. And sometimes we need to ask ourselves those questions. And here God asked them of us, why are you hiding from me? Why did you believe someone else, not me? And of course, God can only have in his presence that which is righteous and perfect, and they no longer were. And so they had to be banished from the garden. But I want to share with you a couple of things that's important for us to remember. Sin causes separation between us and God. All of us sin, and it causes a gap. How did Adam react? How did we react? Think about when you're raising your children, when they did something that disappointed, they knew it was wrong and disappointed. They wanted to be away from you. They didn't, want, they didn't want to see you walk in the room. We kind of have that feeling with God, too. Sin causes separation from God, and we know that the consequence of sin is death. We also know that while there are consequences for our sin, no matter how remorseful we are, and God won't always shelter us from that consequence, he still loves us and provides for us. And he did for them too. I turn your attention to Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. He has just got done telling the serpent his penalty. And he talked to Eve about what she's going to have to go through now for her violation of his word. And he went through and told Adam what he was going to be facing. But just before he banished them from the garden, these words appear. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. You see, he may have, God may have been disappointed. He have been, may have been angry at their disobedience, but he still loved them. And he's still provided for them. And I think sometimes when we sin, we have this feeling that we've disappointed God. We've made him angry. But he won't love us now. Here's proof. You can disappoint God. You can make him angry. You cannot make him stop loving you. Think of your own kids. They did things that would disappoint you, things that made you angry, disobeyed you. But did you stop loving them? Did you stop feeding them? Did you stop clothing them? Did you stop housing them? Of course not. And your Father in heaven loves you even more than that. So sin causes separation from God, but sin does not cause God to stop loving us. And the final point I want to hit on this morning is this connection between Adam and Jesus that I talked about earlier. See, with Adam, when he sinned, it developed the concept of original sin, that because of Adam's sin, all of us 
have been affected by this disease. It's passed from one to another. Death came through one man. Because we know and, and we see in Romans, Paul says the penalty of sin is death. And so it's made clear that through one man, Adam, sin has brought death. But in Christ, we're given the opportunity to be restored. See, Adam's sin and corruption came through, but God still loved us. And God, God still provided a way, so he provided a vaccine, an antidote, a cure for this disease that we call sin. And that antidote is Jesus Christ. He made available to all of us the ability to become righteous in God's eyes once again, to be allowed to be back in fellowship with him and to be brought into his presence. See, Adam's disease transmitted the sin into the life stream of the human race, caused corruption in all people thereafter. All humans are now born into the world with an impulse toward sin and evil. When death entered the world through sin, and now all people are subject to death. We all are. It's the one thing we know we all have in common. That day, whether it's near or far, awaits us. But God has provided the antidote. And just like the vaccine is out there for this illness that's going around now, it's up to us to make a choice. Are we going to receive the cure, the vaccine, or not? In Christ, we are given the opportunity to be restored to our true uncorrupted nature, to live into the life we were originally created to live. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, put it this way, that the great end of religion is to renew our hearts in the image of God, to repair that total loss of righteousness and true holiness that we sustain by the sin of our first parent, meaning Adam. And just as 1 Corinthians says in, in Romans 5, Paul says, as by one man's disobedience, meaning Adam's, the many, meaning all of us who are born, were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, Jesus' obedience, even to death on the cross, the many will be made righteous. Because if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and believe he is the Son of God and who died to take away our sins, his righteousness is now put on our shoulders. This is Paul's way of spelling out both the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of salvation. Christ can redeem all. He can redeem all because of his faithfulness in God and perfect love and obedience. And that perfect love and obedience matches and exceeds the disobedience of one man, Adam. But he gave us free will. He gave us a cure. Are we willing to accept it? I'll conclude with this quote from John Wesley in one of his sermons. And th think about this. He wrote this back in the 1700s. Know your disease. Know your cure. Ye were born in sin. Therefore, ye must be born again, born of God. By nature, you are wholly corrupted. By grace, ye shall be wholly renewed. In Adam, ye all died. In the second Adam, that is, in Christ, ye all are made alive. You that were dead in sins hath he quickened. He hath already given you a principle of life, even faith in him who loved you and gave himself for you. Now go on from faith to faith until your whole sickness is healed and all that mind be in you that was also in Jesus Christ. Dear friends, apart from God's grace leading us to redemption, we have no hope of deliverance from control over original sin over us. 
but by God's grace made available to all of us in Jesus Christ and through the discipleship to him with his church, we do. As we close today, I just want to put forth this invitation. If any of you in this room today or any of those of you who are watching online have never taken the step of asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, to be the cure of your disease, to provide the redemption from sin. Today's the day. Ask him for forgiveness. He will grant it. And for those of you who have already made that decision and made that commitment, renew that obligation, renew that decision, reinforce it in your own lives. For some of you, this may be a day that alters your eternity. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you have throughout all generations wanted a relationship with us and gave us free choice. But our sinful nature kept us from you. We acknowledge, dear Father, that we are sinners. And we ask for your forgiveness. And we thank you and accept the wonderful gift that you've given us of Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior for the redemption of our sins. Lord, we ask you to come into our hearts and into our lives. We thank you that you've given us Jesus. And we thank you for your love. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. Would you please join me for the closing hymn? You can stand if you are able. I'm going to sing Lead On, O King Eternal, which you can find in your hymnal, page 580.